I'm Stuart Childs and you're welcome to the Dairy Edge, the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. With up to 1.6 million dairy calves being born over the next few months, the fear of any disease outbreak is high on every dairy farmer's mind. Having spoken about general calf management and scour in recent weeks, this week we're going to look at one of the other major killers of calves, bovine respiratory disease. Today I'm joined by Sarah Higgins, who is ruminant and equine manager for MSD, to talk about bovine respiratory disease, which most people will more commonly associate with pneumonia. And I started by asking Sarah to explain exactly what bovine respiratory disease is. So respiratory disease, or better known as bovine respiratory disease, or BRD, it's actually quite a multifactorial disease entity. And it involves the host, which is the animal. So in this case, we discussed in calves. It also invo- involves the environment that they're in and then the pathogens. And the pathogens is a term to use the infectious agents involved. So that would be typically viruses such as RSV, PI3 or coronavirus in calves, bacteria like Mannheimia hemolytica or pastorella and then also parasites, which would be mainly your lungworm as well. And then what happens is this all uh, culminates in uh, pulmonary lesions. So you get lesions in the lungs. And I think most people, most farmers and vets would refer to it as pneumonia, but the umbrella term is bovine respiratory disease and pneumonia will be the main feature then of that um, disease. So the pneumonia is kind of the the fallout of the impact of the other things really that you mentioned there. So the causes, as you said, there are the the Mannheimer hemolytica and the um, Astralis oh, multicide is another Astralis, one. Yeah, yeah thanks. <laughs> they like they're they're very prevalent in the environment as a whole. Really, are they? Yeah, so I think for, for calves, I think we're better off starting with the viruses. So typically speaking, you get a primary viral infection and that classically would be RSV, PI3. And what happens there is that the virus really uh, suppress the immune system or defense mechanisms of the calf and then they get these secondary bacterial infections. So healthy calves have bacteria in the back of their throat in their nasopharynx and that would be mainly Mannheimia hemolytica. And as I said, if they get a primary viral infection, then Mannheimia hemolytica can, can move down the respiratory tract into the lungs and colonization occurs there. And what happens then is if you've got a primary viral infection and a secondary bacterial infection, it basically makes the, the clinical outcome more severe. You get more severe clinical signs and therefore it can be also more difficult to treat and you might have a higher instance of mortality when you get a mixed infection. And that's generally what can happen in calves. So I suppose just in terms of the respiratory disease then, Sarah, how prevalent is it on farms? And like just given that the likes of RSV and PI3 that you've mentioned are very prevalent in the environment as a whole, how how, how serious is, are, is respiratory disease in calves in particular? Unfortunately, it's very, very prevalent. And just going back on the RSV and the PA3 viruses, there's been serology testing done on the adult population in Ireland. And there's a massive instance, very high level of antibodies circulating in adult cattle, which means they've all been exposed. A lot of them, a high percentage, have been exposed to RSV and PI3 during the life. And then in relation to bovine respiratory disease in younger calves, unfortunately, it's very, very prevalent. And year in, year out, it's the number one cause of death in cattle greater than one month of age in Ireland. So a lot of these calves, unfortunately, Unfortunately, that don't make it can be sent to their local region veterinary labs where their postmortem is performed. And as I said, the number one cause of mortality or deaths in cattle greater than one month of age is respiratory disease. So it's very, very prevalent. So it's probably more common than we're actually giving people give it credit for in terms of the impact that it's having. And is that possibly because they might not always have a huge number of clinical cases but that there's probably more because that virus is circulating in the environment and then the seasonality of the calving pattern in Ireland and so forth means that there's a big load trying to be dealt with at at the one time Um, and a lot of things need to go in your favour for everything to go right so is it the fact that basically that they don't have the immunity developed to it that they're getting it or is are there other factors involved in it? Yeah there's lots of factors so uh Young calves, they're born with a immune system developed, but they have no antibodies. So they're completely dependent on receiving adequate antibodies from the beastins, from the colostrum, from their cows. So from farm to farm, the quality of that may vary or the quantity that they're getting. So that would be one factor that would play a part in their immunity against any challenge, whether it's viral or bacterial. But then there's other risk factors that would be involved. You know, you know, your stock density in your shed. Um, also, you know, uh, the, the feed space allowance, you know, are there other stressful things going on at the same time? Is there a different age group of, of calves coming into the same batch mix and anything like that that can disrupt the hierarchy in a cat in the 
bunch of calves can cause stress. And if you get stress on these young calves, on top of maybe a poor immune system or an inadequate beast intake, that can just suppress their immune system and they're susceptible to developing disease. And that can be scour or pneumonia. You know, it doesn't have to be just respiratory disease. It can be or a navel infection. If their immune system is compromised, they can ultimately succumb to infection. Even if you got your bee stings right, so there are so many other factors involved in it. It's not necessarily going to completely eliminate your risk of respiratory disease occurring. So so does that suggest then that we need to be taking action maybe to make sure that, that like, so we, we've spoken about vaccinating against scour and obviously we're, the focus there is get your your um, bee stings into the calf as early as possible. So our one, two, three rule. Um, and then we're also looking at trying to get everything right for, for them to keep them in, in, in as good a shape as possible and keep them on the transition milk maybe for five to seven days, depending on, on, on kind of how things work on farms as such, but trying to get them to get a share of transition milk anyway. Like the respiratory side of things, we could have everything done correctly, but f- there could be issues within the shade, within like, and is it almost inevitable that there's going to be something occur like you've mentioned the stresses there like calves get moved around in groups within farms it's inevitable that that's going to happen no matter how much we try to prevent it it's like it's not a it's not a hospital ward where you can isolate them all or anything like that so they're going to be moved so there's a stress associated with that they're going to be disbudded at some point so there's a stress associated with that and we've all this rsv and pi3 circulating in the atmosphere and with the, again with the best will in the world there's like you're, there's adult stock in close proximity somewhere around the yard so is it inevitable that they're going to be exposed to these quite vulnerable to them i suppose yes and i think the, what you pointed out there about the, all the different stressful events that occur in their early life definitely are triggers now the instance of the virus in each herd may be a specific to farm to farm but we can kind of generalize that there is a high instance in it across the country and what we can do i suppose to further maximize the immunity of these calves is you know impl- have a good vaccination program implemented on your farm that can uh, protect against rsv and pi3 and there is now a vaccine available that can be given at the day of birth and it's just a two mil intranasal vaccination and it has a very quick onset of immunity of one week to protect against both viruses RSV and PI3. It also reduces the viral shedding from the calves and it has a duration of immunity of 12 weeks. So if you can get in there to, to boost their immunity, you know, at, at the day of birth, along with your your uh, your good quality beastins early in life and with the other control measures in place, like we've already discussed, good ventilation and whatnot, then you're giving that calf the best chance it can have early in life. Okay, and then I suppose just f- if we take it that the vaccination becomes standard practice, maybe does that pr- um, result that we'll say is that animal safe from respiratory disease long term into the future, or is it just the short term uh, kind of getting them over the hump of the calving shed area, and once they're out to grass, then again they're, are they exposed to a whole heap of other challenges there again, and does it mean that there's further vaccination required? into the future to avoid the bovine respiratory disease issues or is it that they're getting set you're setting them up so well in that first three month period that they're now a good and robust to be able to deal with any challenge that they're going to meet assuming that they don't have any other kind of factor that's predisposing them to to being exposed to anything like that is that fair to say or, or are you actually looking at kind of a longer term vaccination strategy around the uh, respiratory diseases for the animal as a young animal? Well, as I just said, the RSV and the PI3, the duration of immunity is 12 weeks. So you're getting them through that high risk period. Now, unfortunately, you know, um, in some circumstances, it won't protect them further on in life against other, we'll say, viruses or other bacteria that may play a part in pneumonia. You know, as I said, they're Mannheimia hemolytica. So there's a, other vaccinations on the market that can cover that as well, Mannheimia and RSV and PI3 together. And some people may need to implement a vaccination program once the 12 weeks is over. And other herds actually might need to go in sooner, depending on the, the instance of disease within their herd or, we'll say, previous uh, nasal swab results taken from their own veterinary practitioner or post-mortem results involved and then obviously as cattle progress in life as well they can be exposed to viruses such as bovine herpes virus 1 which is which is your IBR uh, most people would know it as and you want to make sure that your 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 cattle and particularly your heifers are protected against that and that's a different vaccination that's involved so as the animals move on in life they can be exposed to different viruses or be at, at risk of different viruses but the main thing we can say here Stuart is that 
the, the calves are protected against the main two viral culprits that calves are exposed to early in life um, when they're in that risk period. Okay, so very good. So I suppose just to p- put it into context, I suppose in terms of how significant is kind of the underlying respiratory disease, maybe that m- not the clinical cases will say in terms of impact on farm performance. So like I'm sure there's plenty of studies done in relation to how respiratory disease impacts on animals and like every animal be they beef or dairy as soon as they hit the ground the day they're born we kind of need them to be doing fairly good level again consistently to in order to achieve all the targets that they have for for breeding for the dairy heifers and obviously age to slaughter is becoming very very significant from the point of view of carbon emissions etc so how how important is it that um people are kind of thinking about their bovine respiratory disease status maybe so like maybe not getting a lot of pneumonia in cows will pe- will people say i don't have to worry about it or is it something that they should be concerned about and thinking about yeah i think that people should be concerned and thinking about it because like what you just said that they can have it has massive impact on productivity later in life so you know people may think or farmers in particular might think of the short-term costs of a, a bout of pneumonia in calves or a batch of calves they think of the treatment costs they think of the cost of having the vet out to examine the animals and to treat them accordingly they may think as well about the calves that they lost the mortality but they don't think about the the long-term repercussions and productivity on the cattle that had it but survived so there's lots of studies done like you said and in one study in particular that it involved of 215 heifers and it showed that if they had one bout of bovine respiratory disease or pneumonia in their first eight weeks of life that led to lung lesions so led to kind of damaged tissue in their lung they can have 525 litres less milk in their first lactation that's a significant figure and also they can take up to 15 days longer to start their their first lactation so that's from the dairy side and then from the beef side uh, there's been lots of studies carried out and in one study in particular it showed that cattle with overt clinical signs so the ones that had the typical classic signs of pneumonia you know snotty nose high fever elevated respiration rate off form coughing and they can take up to 59 days longer to finish and the cattle then who were subclinical so the ones that looked perfectly normal to you or i or the the farmer the vets in this case in the pen with the clinically sick cattle took 33 days longer to finish so it has you know massive um consequences on productivity and then ultimately profitability for the farm at the end of the day so i think it's it's something that you know we should all be aiming to prevent early in life because of this yeah so actually you've just in your description of it there now you probably hit on things there so high temperatures we'll say the snotty nose an overtly snotty nose is obviously going to be noticeable to people but like nobody's going to cop a high temperature unless they are physically constantly taking temperatures obviously so the chances are with the with these viral infections, it's no different to kids that they get the spike of temperature, basically. So that means that there are animals more than likely if quite significantly affected by subclinical um, respiratory disease. And that this is something that is very real for people on a lot of levels. And we're not aware of it at all as such. Yeah. And I think actually there's, there's a big variance in, in different studies, but it ranges between 23 and 64 percent of cattle can be subclinical cases. So that's massive. If you're at the spectrum of 64%, you know, in a shed. And as I said, they're the ones that just don't have any overt clinical signs. They look perfect. Their ears aren't drooped. They look full to look at. They're not panting, but they have lesions, you know, in their in their respiratory tract. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's very, it's look at bovine respiratory disease. It's far reaching the impact of it, really. OK, so I suppose uh, just to sum it all up, I suppose then, Sarah, like, You've been very um, clear to mention that it's not the exact solution to the problem. It's part of the toolkit. So what are the main things that people need to be considering in relation to bovine respiratory disease that they need to cover off uh, from, from the day the calf hits the ground? Yeah, so I'll just reiterate what you said. You're right, it's 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 part of the, the toolkit. You know, it's a multifaceted approach. Unfortunately, vaccination by itself isn't the be-all and end-all, but it's a very, very important component to control measures. And I suppose the other control measures is having, you know, good ventilation or good housing, having good biosecurity, good hygiene measures, and then overall good farm managing practices. And if you go in with uh, an intranasal vaccine at the day of birth against RSV and PI3 to protect against respiratory disease and reduce the nasal shedding of both those viruses early in life, in in let's say encompassing the other control measures and um, then you're setting that you know you're maximizing the immunity of that calf and you're minimizing the infectious pressure that they're exposed to and ultimately reducing the incidence or the likelihood of, of you know getting respiratory disease early in life okay very good so long and short of it is um 
if you have a problem and the problem is actually triggered by some other pressure so you have a shed for 100 calves and you have 150 calves in it don't expect the vaccine to solve the problem. You have a whole lot of other things to do first before you vaccinate. And actually, as well, just when you said that, probably if I know it's not suitable for every place or practical, but if you keep your calf numbers reduced to less than 50, and I know even some places say around 30, you know, the smaller size that you have in a shed, you're reducing your risk of transmitting disease. You know, if you go into a shed with 100 calves plus or 100, you know, the increase in numbers, just you're increasing the risk profile there as well. And maybe, you know, the, the chain or the, the different ages in that shed as well um so that's a high risk setup then for infection so just uh, i suppose given that point as well though and given the scale that a lot of farms are at now the logistics aren't just aren't feasible like i mean we would have shown an example of a very good calf shed at the dairy conference last november last december and it would be capable of taking over 200 calves and they're all in one in one shed basically so it, that's where the, the vaccination is going to become very important then because you've no way of breaking the, the cycle as such. But they, no, to be fair, those calves aren't under any stress or anything like that. But they, but we've already said that they're going to go through some few little stressful changes or whatever that could trigger something. So the vaccination in that scenario, all things being, all things, all other things being good, would be a very, very beneficial tool for that farmer to consider then. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and I think as well, if people are worried about different agents involved in their farms as well, it's very important that they actually contact their own veterinary practitioner or engage with them and they will help, you know, um, do diagnostics, carry out nasal swabs or bronchial alveolar lavages, which is like a lung wash, um, and they'll be able to kind of help implement a good vaccine program for each herd. And then slightly curveball maybe, <laughs> but... We've heard an awful lot in the last few years about cows coughing and people um, dosing them for lungworm and so forth and maybe repeatedly dosing them for lungworm and finding that they're getting no impact. How significantly related to bovine respiratory disease is that scenario? It is bovine respiratory disease. So exactly. If I just go back through what I said about the pathogens. So, you know, that's the term for infectious agents. So that would be viruses, bacteria and parasites. So the parasitic agent involved in pneumonia or respiratory disease is lungworm, Dictyocolus pv paris. And actually it's one of the main, we'll say, pathogens isolated in the labs on postmortem in front of bacteria and viruses often. So there's a a very, very high instance of it. Um, And unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be going away anywhere. And I think we're dealing with a lot of resistance to some drugs um, within or antimintics within the the herds involved. And there could also be issues of pasture management. Um, But there's actually a vaccine on the market as well that can protect against um, lungworm uh, to younger stock as well. It's an oral dose, two doses, four weeks apart. And that can be implemented to to help um, if you're dealing with you know, issues, as you said, of those coughing cows, that dry husky cough associated with lungworm or who's. Very good, Sarah. Thanks very much for coming on today and uh, appreciate your time and talk to you again soon. Thanks very much. That's all for this week's episode of the Dairy Age podcast. And my thanks to Sarah Higgins for joining me on this week's show. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen on Apple and Google podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Stuart Childs and join me next time for your Dairy Edge.